Thank you for joining us here today. Today we're going to be talking about flow cytometry and our understanding of COVID-19. Um, and this is a bit of an update to a webinar that we did um, in the early days of the pandemic. And here we're going to be talking about some of the, the recent research that's shedding light on the previously unanswered questions about COVID-19. So the ongoing questions um, include why are men more likely to suffer serious effects? Um, why do vaccines based on the ancestral form of the virus still work against the new variants of concern? Uh, and can we track an individual's exposure history based on their immune response even after immunization? So the first paper that I want to highlight today is this publication in Viruses. Uh, it's um, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein uh, S1 mediated endothelial injury and pro-inflammatory state um, is amplified by dihydrotestosterone and prevented by mineral corticoid antagonism. And this was published by Kumar et al. So first, let's have a little bit of background to this. Now, I think we, we all know that men seem to face higher odds of illness due to uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And it's also well known that men have higher plasma concentrations of androgens such as dihydrotestosterone. Now, interestingly, it was found that patients receiving androgen therapy for the treatment of prostate cancer were less likely to be infected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and it's also known that endothelial activation plays a critical role in coronavirus disease and causes thrombosis due to vascular inflammation. It's also been found that increased levels of circulating vascular cell adhesion molecule VCAM1 and E-selectin have been reported in patients with um, COVID-19 uh, and are associated with higher levels of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines indicating endothelial injury. Right, now on to some data. So this is not flow cytometry data. Um, this is um, mRNA expression data. Now, you can use flow cytometry to measure mRNA, um, but we're, we're not going to go into that today. Um, so here, what the authors have done is they've incubated aortic endothelial cells in the presence of a first spike protein alone. And in the presence of, of spike protein, we see an increase in E-selectin, but no real increase in VCAM1 or ICAM1. However, when you combine spike protein with um, dihydrotestosterone, DHT, we get this synergistic increase in the expression of, of E-selectin. So E-selectin is expressed at an even higher level and we also start to see an increase in VCAM1 expression, which we don't see, remember, with just spike protein alone. We also see a, a more modest but still significant increase in um, ICAM1 uh, ex expression. Um, and so we have um, this um, synergistic increase where spike proteins and DHT cooperate to increase damage-associated transcripts. And this is abrogated if you use a, uh, a minocorticoid receptor uh, antagonist. Right, on to the flow cytometry portion of this paper. Now, I thought I'd, I'd highlight this just because it shows how flow cytometry can be used for uh, assays that, that don't necessarily involve cells. So we're all quite familiar with the idea of, of measuring the properties of cells using flow cytometry. But this shows that flow cytometry can be used much, 
for, for many more applications than, than just cells. And this is a, a, a bead-based array. Um, and this works very similar to how a, a, an ELISA works. So essentially you have a, um, a antibody attached to a bead, and that antibody is specific for a solute of interest. You incubate your bead with your, um, in, with your, um, with human serum in this case, and the the solute binds to the the antibody, and then you can detect binding of um, of that with a secondary antibody. Uh, the advantage of of using flow rather than an ELISA in this context is that you can multiplex. So you can vary the brightness of the bead because the bead um, um, has a, is associated with a, a, a signal itself. And you can also vary the color of the bead. So essentially you can do um, many, many, many solutes in a single reaction. And that means that if you have samples that are very precious, you can you can um, you, you you can preserve those samples, uh, and you can also get a lot of data uh, in in a very short amount of time. So um, the the authors here have, have looked at VCAM one and um, soluble e selecting um, in the uh, in the serum of patients with COVID nineteen, and just as the previous MRA mRNA data would suggest, we do see an increase in VCAM1 and E-selectin in men um, that are infected with, uh, with COVID-19 versus women. So a significant increase which um, confirms some of that um, mRNA data um, that we saw in, uh, um, uh, endothelial, in the endothelial cell line. So it, it strengthens the, the hypothesis that this, the vascular injury that we see in, um, in COVID-19 is exacerbated by, um, by, by, by male hormones, essentially. Right, now on to our next paper. Um, so this is um, a paper entitled Impact of SARS-CoV-2 Variants on the Total CD4 and CD8 T-cell Reactivity Infected or Vaccinated Individuals. Um, this is um, some of the great work that's been coming out of the La Jolla um, Institute for Immunology in San Diego. All right, so some background again for this one. Uh, now, we know that the emergence of new variants of concern has implications for the control of the disease and that mutations that are of the greatest concern are present in the viral spike protein. The changes present in some variants have been associated with a reduction in antibody binding and function and following vaccination, mutations are associated with a loss or reduction in the, um, in the neutralizing antibody activity. And this has been a source of quite a lot of concern um, globally. However, multiple lines of evidence suggest that T cell responses are as or maybe more important in determining the potential impact of, um, of mutations. In this study, T cell responses to variants uh, of concern, uh, peptides, were assessed from individuals recovering from the ancestral strain or recently vaccinated with the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. So what the researchers have done here is they've derived a peptide pool, which is based on the sequences of SARS-CoV-2, as well as the, well, the ancestral strain, as well as the sequences of the different variants of concern. 
And they've used that peptide pool to stimulate T cells from uh, donors that are recovering, the convalescent donors that are recovering from the ancestral strain of the virus. And although this is quite a busy slide, the conclusion from this is, is really quite simple. There is no significant effect in terms of the T cell response, and here we've got T cell response measured by the expression of um, CD137 and either um, OX40 or CD69, depending on whether it's a, a CD4 positive or a CD8 positive T cell. So what that means is that regardless of um, what the new challenge is, if you've been infected with the ancestral strain, then the response from your T cells will be the same. So what we've seen already is that peptide pools generated from the spike protein um, sequence of either the ancestral strain or the, the variants of concern has the same effect on T cells from convalescent donors. And these were donors uh, infected with the, the ancestral form of, of SARS-CoV-2. The authors of the paper then went on to look at um, a vaccinated donors. So these are donors vaccinated with either Pfizer all Moderna vaccines, and they're, they're stimulated with peptide pools generated from the SARS-CoV-2 variant spike, just as before. And, and just as before, the data shows really no significant difference in T cell reactivity to spike proteins, regardless of whether these were infected individuals or vaccinated individuals. Uh, and that leads to the, the conclusion that T cell reactivity following vaccination is unaffected by mutations present in variants of concern. Obviously, that is pretty good news. So why is that? Um, I think we've all heard that the spike protein is, is heavily mutated in these variants of concern. Well, here we have a, a, a display of the epitopes recognized by T cells in convalescent subjects that were identified, and the number of those that were affected by mutations in variants of concern was, was, was analyzed. So on the top row there, we have the epitopes of the most immunodominant proteins. And you can see, um, in terms of those epitopes, we've lost only really quite a small proportion of, of these epitopes in the variants of concern. Um, probably the, the, um, the largest change is in the, the British variant of concern there, where you, you can see we've got 80% of the epitopes remaining. Um, but even in the ones that were, have been lost, the most common mutation is just a single mutation. So potentially we've still got some, some reactivity there. If we look at the epitopes for the spike protein, um, we see a, a very similar story. So even though you know that they, they have the spike protein has had mutations, the epitopes are still intact in the majority of cases. So we can see that probably the the, um, the largest reduction is in the South African variant of concern. But even here, we've still got um, seventy percent. Of the uh, of the T cell epitopes uh, surviving, and this is just CD4 positive T cells that I'm showing here. So, on average, 91.5% of CD4 and 98.1% of CD8 epitopes were unaffected by mutations in the variants of concern. And if we look at the spike protein um, alone, we see um, 89.7% of CD4 and 96.4% of CD8 epitopes 
were conserved in variants of concern. So this gives a really nice mechanistic explanation of why even with these heavily mutated spike proteins, when it comes to T cell responses, there's really not much difference. And obviously, this again, I'm going to say this is this is fantastic news, isn't it? Because okay, it means that perhaps your antibodies that you've generated for uh, for the, the um, for the uh, from the vaccine or from a previous infection of the ancestral strain are not going to be able to neutralize the vaccine the the, uh, the the virus and stop you from getting infected. But when it comes to your T cell responses, they're already very primed. So all right, you might you might get infected, but your T cell response is going to is going to kick into high gear quickly, and hopefully you're going to clear that infection very quickly. So I think probably the, the, the take home message from this is um, vaccines work, even in these variants of concern. Now, the last paper for today is another contribution from um, the, uh, the La Jolla Institute of Immunology. Um, these guys have, have made an absolutely phenomenal contribution um, and published uh, just a huge number of high impact papers um, in this subject. So this is a development of a T cell based immunodiagnostic system to effectively distinguish SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 vaccination status. So the background for this. And we've already seen in the previous paper that correlation of protection may not closely reflect antibody titer and may require a much more mechanistic understanding. Our ability to measure T cell responses, however, is hindered by the lack of immunodiagnostic tools that can discriminate between pre-existing immunity, vaccination, and infection. Now, the ability to distinguish between T cell activation due to vaccination or infection may have wide reaching implications for longitudinal vaccination studies, for booster vaccine strategy, and the understanding of long COVID-19. So, just as in that previous study, what we have here is a T cell activation assay based on stimulation with peptide megapoles. And here we've essentially got three different types of megapoles. So we've got the, uh, a megapole of um, the, the spike proteins. So, sorry, the, the spike protein peptide megapole. Then we've got the whole proteome excluding the spike protein, then the whole proteome, including the spike protein, and also a control uh, Epstein-Barr virus megapole. And the, the, the authors have um, activated T cells from four different groups with these different megapoles. So we have a, a, a no infection, no vaccination group. That's gray. We have the infection, but no vaccination group. That's red. We have the no infection, but vaccinated. That's blue. And we have finally uh, infection and vaccination. And that is yellow. And you can see that, that uh, dependent on your, um, your, your immunological status, the response that your T cells make to these four, well, so these three different megapoles um, varies significantly. It's, it's probably most pronounced in, in this, 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 um, this, second, uh, the, 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 this, this second panel from the, uh, from the left where you see that the no infection um, but vaccinated group don't respond at all or very little 
to the uh, the proteome excluding the spike protein and that obviously that makes perfect sense because the um, in in this case the the vaccination is either Pfizer or Moderna vaccines and so they're they're the mRNA vaccines based on the, the, the spike protein. So if you if if, if the um, the megapole doesn't include any of those those epitopes, there, there shouldn't be any reaction. But here's the really neat part. So by examining the T cell reaction of an individual to the, the those um, three different peptide pools, the researchers were able to uh, essentially develop a predictive um, matrix of what group um, or, you know, what the, the immun immunological status of, a, uh, of an individual. So whether they'd been vaccinated, whether they'd been infected, whether they'd been vaccinated and infected, or none of the above. And as well as um, helping in longitudinal studies and um, in terms of vaccine booster schedules and understanding long COVID, uh, I think this, this has implications also to further um, emergent viruses. So this is not, I think, useful just in the context of SARS-CoV-2, but potentially any uh, future pandemic um, is, is going to benefit from this research. So a really important, great piece of research. So now just a very quick look at the ZE5 cell analyzer. All the flow cytometry data that you saw in this presentation was collected using the ZE5. And it's got some really great capabilities. So it, it, will, um, it has up to 30 parameters, five lasers, 27 colors, plus a small particle detector, which means it's really great for complex immunophenotyping experiments. Also has an integrated sample loader, which gives you really great flexibility. And this sample loader can handle racks of 45 mil tubes, 40 1.5 mil Eppendorfs, uh, 96 well plates, 384 well plates, and pretty much any format of plate. So round bottom, flat bottom, V bottom, deep well, it can handle them all. And there's no hardware switchover. So switching between, say, tubes and plates, it's very, very simple. Um, and there's also no chance of probe damage. So even if you do something really silly, like leave the lid on your 96 well plate, it's not going to damage your instrument. There's also no extra cleaning associated with using plates. And we have cooling uh, and agitation built in. So it means that's going to preserve your cells and stop any chance of, um, of blockages developing. It's also a very fast instrument, so it will run up to 100,000 events per second. Um, and what it means is it's really great for rare event analysis. So if you're doing an assay, say, for instance, it's a T-cell stimulation assay, where you want to run a, a large number of events per sample, it really helps with that. It also has a really fast plate sampling rate. So it, it will get through a 96 well plate in about 15 minutes. Uh, and that means that it's really great for high throughput and, and screening. Uh, and, and just to be clear, you can do rare event analysis in that sort of time. So a 96 well plate, you can run a 96 well plate 100,000 events per well in 15 minutes. Finally, it's got some really great automated features. So it's got an automated quality control. It's got an automated filter check. It's got genuine walk away operation. So you don't have to watch this instrument collect your data. You don't have to babysit it. You don't have to make sure that it's going to get through the plate without blocking. It will do it. You just leave it alone to do its thing. You can go away and do something more useful. 
Um, we also can do really easy integration into robotic work cells, which mean, may, means that it's really great for productivity. <clears throat> Finally, just a, a really quick look at our new range of dyes. So these are our Starbright dyes. And I just thought I'd put these in because they're a really great new range of dyes that are exclusive to Biorad. They've been specifically developed for flow cytometry. And they have some really great properties, properties that are, are, are really going to help um, in, in any research project. Um, so they're very bright, which means we get increased resolution of populations. Um, and that, that's great for positive or, or negative selection of cells. Um, we have really narrow excitation and emission spectra. And that means that we get less spillover and spread, and your data is going to be of better quality. They're instrument compatible, so they're compatible with all the common uh, lasers. They are not just com they don't, ju don't just work on the ZE5. They'll work on any instrument out there. Um, they're suitable for conventional flow as well as spectral flow. Um, and they have unique spectral profiles as well. So if you want to add more, um, more markers to your, your spectral panel, check out Starbright dyes. Um, you, you'll, be, you'll definitely be able to add some. They work in all buffers. So you can avoid special buffers. A lot of the dyes out there, um, you have to use a special buffer to stop them from binding to each other. That doesn't happen with the Starbright dyes. However, if you need to use that special buffer, they're absolutely fine in it. So they work in all buffers. Um, <clears throat> we get really, really consistent staining. They're, they're super stable, both in temperature and light. We've done things like leave them out on the bench in the light for, for four days and not seen any drop in fluorescence. Um, we also see minimal lot-to-lot -lot variability. <clears throat> They're also multiplexing compatible. They work with all fluorescent dyes. They work in large or small panels. You can pre-mix these dyes. So you can, you can set up a, a mix and, and come back to it a, a week later. You'll get exactly the same result. We also have a large choice to provide flexibility when building panels. It means you can follow best practice. So this is now the end of this presentation for today. Thank you very much for listening. Please visit biorad.com slash cell analysis for more information about the ZE5 cell analyzer or biorad dash antibodies.com slash starbright for more information about starbright dyes. So once again, thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Richard, for such an interesting webinar. We've now come to our Q&A session. Please use the Q&A widget to send Richard your questions to answer. We'll follow up with any outstanding questions after the webinar. The first question we've got is, what are the main things to consider when designing a T-cell activation assay? So, um, well, um, aside from having an instrument that's uh, able to detect rare events uh, quickly, Another consideration is that your chlorophore choice. Now, um, for maximum sensitivity of your assay, it's a really good idea to use bright chlorophores on your activation markers. Uh, and this is a general rule of, of thumb with blood cytometry. If you have a rare marker or one that's uh, expressed at a low level, always choose a bright dye for that channel. As I've already said, um, uh, star bright dyes um, are are really ideal for this type of application because, because they're really bright, they have that narrow excitation emission profile, they also work with any buffer, they're super stable, um, and they're ideal for pre-mixing. These are all things that make them um, much easier to use as well. Great. And the next question 
is are there any features of BioRad's instruments that are particularly suited to these types of applications? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I'd say probably the the, um, the most um, the, the the feature that I would I would point to most of all is the uh, the the, the ZD5's ability to um, to handle data at speed. Um, so um, in T cell activation assays, you're going to want to run through um, uh, lots of cells very quickly because you, you're, you're analyzing rare events. Uh, and only a relatively small proportion of the cells are ever going to be positive. Um, and and uh, the Z5 ability to measure 100,000 events per second is where it gives its, um, its ability and its, its reliability. Um, sorry, is what it gives it its ability to um, to deliver those events at, at, a, at a reasonable speed, at not at high speed, and also its reliability and resistance to clogging means it can carry on churning out data at fast pace. Right. Um, is the ZD5 available in any different configurations, and can they be upgraded? Yes, absolutely. So the, the Z5 has 11 different configurations with three to five lasers. The three laser configuration can be upgraded, upgraded, for example, with the addition of a UV laser or with a small particle detector. The fluidic tanks can also be upgraded with the addition of um, external bulk fluidic tanks um, that can allow the instrument to operate for up to 24 hours without refilling. We can also hook up the Z5 to house the ionized water supply. And although it's not strictly an upgrade, the Z5 is also designed to be automation ready. Uh, and by adding robotics, you can increase your throughput really dramatically. Where can I find out more information about the Z5 cell analyzer? Well, that's, that's a really easy one. Um, Come and visit our website. Um, the address um, is uh, is shown is shown here. Uh, and don't don't hesitate to ask to speak to a specialist. We can discuss your needs one to one, and uh, even give you a virtual tour of the system. Um, if you if you like what you see, we can also arrange an on-site demonstration so you can try your assays out and see the instrument firsthand. Right. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you for everyone for listening. Um, this is all we have time for today, and we'll follow up with any outstanding questions by email. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.